Yay! Are we live? Is we're live. Recording? Yeah. <laughs> we're live. It's it's Wednesday again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's another hump day, but this is a very special hump day. Are you prepared? Wow, that was a pun if I've ever heard one. <laughs> Ooh. So yes, this is a very, very special hump day uh, because we're talking about sex work. Yeah. Again, it's going to be great. I'm really excited about this one. Are you excited? Audience, this is part two. And the thing that I loved about the first one was y'all may have not known anything about sex work, but in the first one, we told you what sex for survival looked like. And we really didn't get into a lot of the secrets and build on it. But now we're back and we got three amazing people and I'm super excited. What are you most excited about on this episode? I don't know. I just like, I love, you know, I love salacious content. I just love it. I love it. So I'm just excited to get down to like the nitty gritty stuff, you know, hear some stories. Yeah. So I'm excited. I think it's going to be awesome. So should we, should we, uh, should we get started? I hope the audience is ready. Yeah, I hope so too. Hold on to your wig. Oh, you got your wig glue on? (laughs) Are you ready? (laughs) (laughs) All right. So um let's 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 bring our guests on. Let's Let's bring them in. (laughs) All right. Hi. Uh, Hi. (laughs) Yeah, these are our lovely panelists. We're missing one just for right now. Uh, she's going to join us in just a little bit, but want to get started here. So if uh, y'all would like to introduce yourselves and uh, just say just a little bit yeah, about you know what you do. Who you are. You can go ahead. I, I was going to actually, if you want to start, I would like to. Uh, you, you, want, you feel more comfortable if I started? Uh, you're the newbie. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Oh, he's been here before. Okay, cool. Um, I'm I'm Antoine slash AJ. Um, what can we say? Ho? I don't. Is that a cuss word? Uh-oh. <laughs> that's the word. That's the word I pick. I'm a hoe. High class hoe. ATH. You know, I I'm a. But I mean, primarily, I'm validated more by my singing. I'm a singer. Um, I act a model in Miami, in Orlando. And sometimes in Boston as well. So I don't know what else you want to know. Mr. Worldwide over here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Come thank you for now. being here tonight. You're, you know, we really appreciate you for coming out. Well, I thank you for having me. I really, you know, somebody asked me to be on some on something. I almost cussed on something. <laughs> 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 I appreciate that. Definitely. Roman, uh, our veteran. So hello, it's me again, Miss Roman Black. Um, I am a full-time escort. I am a part-time um, content creator for Dust for Fans. Um, and then I also own and operate my own consulting business that focuses on community growth um, and exploration. Um, I love my community. I love what I do. Um, it's allowed me to travel all over the U.S. Um, and be my own boss, you know? I'm like the city girls, except I don't rap about it. <laughs> you, 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 guys, you guys could. Period. <laughs> just start pulling it I can't out. Play out, though. Video. <laughs> More I, just, I just look real cute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I love that. That brings me to our first, oh, our first question. So in the, in the last time, and just to catch the audience up, the last time we talked about sex work, and I give you the same um, disclaimer, which is, you know, we're going to be talking about a lot about sex, consent, sex work, and things like that. So if you're feeling triggered, just be very careful. We'll put links below. Always feel free to seek out counseling and support. Um, right now, we're going to be talking about the consensualness of sex practices and sex work. So let's start it off with something really juicy. That's a, very different from last time. Number one question to start off the night. Most outlandish industry story. AJ, I want to start it off with you. What is your most outlandish story to tell the audience? And believe me, this is the time to tell it. <laughs> I'm so excited. Well, okay, but see, I didn't have 
I don't I don't see so much stuff. What what kind of outlandish? Tell us <laughs> tell us what people would not believe if you told them. Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 <laughs> Where I have to interject myself and I'm telling it and be like, no, for real, I'm not lying. I'm not a So this is the part. So, okay, so I had this client, right, in Miami. And I, they'd be on, I don't know if we can talk about drugs, stuff, but they'd be on, on white, you know, white girls and stuff. So um, he was just acting wild, acting a fool. So I had to go. I had to go, I couldn't be there any longer. You know, I got my, I think it was like 600. Um, no, we had to go down to the ATM and get the money. And that's like, I have been there for 30 minutes. I trust the people, we gotta get the money. So I told him to go downstairs. So I was, before we go downstairs, he's like, okay. And I actually have this, this is gonna be on cowboy. Um, he asked me, he grabbed this, you know those little mini bottles of soda? Like a Pepsi mm-hmm. bottle. It wasn't wasn't twenty ounce. It may be like an eight ounce, twelve ounce. It's really a pure size you don't see everywhere. It usually may come in a six pack. He said, "Okay, so you're gonna stick this up my ass." <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Tell Auntie. Is it a curse word? That's okay. Auntie, I'm sorry. Tell Auntie, I'm sorry. Sorry, Auntie. <laughs> leave, me out. leave me out, Auntie. But okay, so he said, "I want you to stick." I want you to stick this up my butt and then <laughs> wait wait a minute, that's not it so he started he wanted to play a game because he wanted to feel me inside him at all times while we were going downstairs while we he said so i'm gonna this is about to be you inside me and i want you to dominate me in front of people so when you say the number two i'm gonna lean up against the wall i'm gonna push the bottle in as far as it can go i'm like bro i'm not doing that i'm not Yelling random numbers on the elevator. <laughs> They're like, "What's if wrong?" With randomly that? press that. Like that's. I think about everything. Like, I'm the Like that's two, and then you back up and you start pushing your booty up against the wall on the elevator. That's not happening. No, let's just go get my money. So we get up. So I, I, I did it. I stick it. I said, "I'll put it up there. I'll put it up there." But I'm not doing the cold thing. So I stuck it up there. You know, before we left the room. We leave the room and it's protruding out as we're walking down the hall. And I'm like, okay, this is And he starts trying to play the game anyway in the elevator. I'm just gonna make an eye contact. I'm I I'm watching you because we gotta get my money, but I'm not making eye contact with you because oh, we're on the elevator. There's a Karen. I, Alicia, does Karen offend you, Alicia? Does Karen offend you? Does oh, Karen offend you? Okay. Well, I mean, do you, do you see this outfit? I would test everybody, okay? No. All right, there's a Karen on the elevator. And, you know, she's already looking weird because you could, you could feel whole energy. You know, whole energy is whole energy on the elevator. So, whatever. So, we get off the elevator. I, I mean, I really don't care, but, you know, you see a fine black dude and you see this middle aged white dude acting crazy. You, you know what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, we go to the ATM and he gets the money. So he has to go to the airport. He asked me to take him. I'm parked in the parking garage. We go to the parking garage and we can say, can we, can we say the D word, D-I-C-A? <laughs> well, you just said it, anyhow. I, I know. <laughs> okay. So I mean, you spelled it. We're in the car. Yeah, I can spell. <laughs> Okay, well, I know, right? But I see, I gotta, I don't know how to be sensitive. <laughs> okay, so that's okay. That's our I'm, like, I'm looking for my filter and put it back in my brain. Like, so, <laughs> I, so we get downstairs, he gets in my car, we go to the ATM, he gets in my car, and I'm taking him to, to the uh, airport. Now, the Coke bottle part is already the part that's like, come on, he won't use a Coke, a Pepsi bottle in his butt, yes. But he starts like, as I'm driving, he starts like opening up the car door before I leave the garage, talking about he wants some more dick. He's going to look for more dick, which kind of offended me because you got some right here. Dude. Blue. Excuse me? No, I mean, we can, like, I don't have nothing to do but make money, so we can go. But you, once you get, you stepping out the car and about to break your ankle, about to get some dick, like, I don't get it. 
But honestly, like so messy. It just didn't make wow. any sense. And then you got the Coke bottle. You still got the Pepsi bottle with your butt. Like, don't forget. So it's like, so you got ha your ankle, half your body out of my car with a Pepsi bottle in your butt, looking for food. And you supposed to be on your way to the airport about to miss your flight. I let him out the car. And wow. I drove off. I, and because I'm a human, because I'm, I have my, what I call personhood, I called him because I just, I'm sorry, braces, and I just ate. And I couldn't water pick before I did this. I know, like, indecent. But um, I called him, and I lied to you not. He was still in that garage looking sick. 10 minutes, 10 minutes after I called him, because I was just worried about the dude. Like, you're crazy. I don't know. You obviously got money, because it's the JW Marriott in Brickle. I don't know if you know Miami. Brickle is. It's you, nice. It's pretty nice. You yeah. okay? So that's probably the most outlandish. Well, that's a I love it. I love it. Audience, I hope your wig glue is on. Oh, I hope man. you're ready for the rest of this conversation. Oh, and Roman, oh. let me send it to you. <laughs> King of, um, King of oh, Kings. Hi. Let's do it. So I guess I'll just uh, keep the theme on me um, and do like the most outlandish thing that um, a client has ever asked me to do. Okay. Um, so I had a client fly me out to Atlanta, um, and I already met the client once before in Atlanta. Um, I was in Atlanta before, like just hanging out, and he we hooked up. So he flew me out to Atlanta. During this trip, though, he specifically had a fantasy where he wanted to see me take as much. Fuck it. Take it. Oh, take as much cum as possible. Um, See, hold on. I knew I knew what the rule was when he first said it. I knew it was about me originally. Um, so he wanted to see me take as much cum as possible. Okay. And I was like, you know, I'm okay with groups. Personally, I'm okay with groups. But you're paying me, so I'm gonna make a little bit extra money on top of this. So we had a deal going. Um, for the first ten that I took, it was twenty dollars extra on top of what I was already getting for my rates. Hello. Anything after 10 was another $10 per afterwards. Um, that night, I ended up taking eight or nine. Um, and then he still wanted to continue the night afterwards. And I was like, my time is up. He's like, here's, I think he gave me another like $500. He's like, no, 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 your time's not up. Here's another 500. We went back to his place. And he kept he kept trying to go. I was like, it is three in the morning. Friend. It is three in the morning. I just got off the plane. Like, Couple of hours prior to, can, can we take a nap? Can we sleep? Nothing, something. All night. He, he was not. <laughs> night. Not not <laughs> Audience, I don't Man. think you're ready for the rest of this, and we're only on question one. <laughs> that was great. That's crazy. Woo. I right. mean, I had a good time. <laughs> okay. It sounds like it, and that's what all, and that's what matters, and that's what matters. Exactly. Um, I agree. Uh, that brings us to our nothing will live up to that. I just uh, <laughs> that was great. So, um, I'm gonna start with you, AJ. Why don't you tell us about your journey with sex work from the start until now? Um, just like loosely, like how I got into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just like a general overview. Um, so I moved to Miami and what, like maybe three or four years ago, I moved to Miami and wait, let me grab my chapstick. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Chapstick's important. It's like Napoleon Dynamite type of stuff. So, um, what, are you still in Florida? Huh? No, I'm in Boston. Oh, it's mm -mm. yeah. Chapstick's important up in Boston. Yeah, I'm here's I dry. Feel I that. feel you. I feel you. I've been in Boston for two months. Hey, Florida. Ooh, bless your heart. So, the okay, much better. So, I was watching Pose, and I'm actually writing a book called Cowboy Confessions. Um, and I was watching the episode of Pose, and I was writing the second chapter of my book, talking about a few points in my life, what I was talking about when I watched Pose, I started crying at the end. I'm like, 
Oh shit, that's me. Oh shoot. I'm sorry, Auntie. Oh shoot. Me. <laughs> I'm like, oh shoot. Oh, you got F5s anyway. Okay, so I'm like, oh shoot, that's my life because my gay mama, uh, Michael, my uh, who I call my lifeline sometimes. I was I moved to Miami. The dude I moved down there with left. My relationship ended. I was living in my car. And coincidentally, I didn't go straight to Hoenn from living in my car. I was working at Chili's. Because I had, like, I come from corporate life. So I was a sales associate at Aventura Mall. And then I started working at Chili's when the sales associate mm-hmm. job ended. So I was living in my car and I met my gay mama. And I was hanging out. And I was crying at the end of the post because I said that was me hanging out with my gay mama in the house for the trannies. Trans, I'm sorry, excuse me, trans people taking care of me. So um, the term, I try to be correct because we all want respect. So if I disrespect somebody, let me know. I'm sorry, but um, you corrected the trans. Yes, the trans uh, trans women. There were no trans men. So yeah, trans women taking care of me. Um, you know, showing me the ropes. And my gay mama looked at me one day and said, "You would eat like you were clean. You would go to cities and you were clean." And I said, "Clean what? Like I don't. I'm not clean." Like, and she's like, no, like, you escorted. And yep. she showed me what he showed me back page. He showed me everything. And from then on, I was living in the, I was living in the basement. I was living in my car. And that's how I met uh, Mike, my knight in shining army. That's how I met him. Because he had been escorting for like maybe, I don't know, 10 years prior. So he, saved my life pretty much because I was standing with him and he put me on yeah and he told me I said okay so I was working at Chili's and a friend of mine it's like I have angels like people be saving my life because you know my a lot of parts of my family ain't a damn thing so I have people who I worked with at my sales associate job they went out they said we have to find you somewhere to live because I was homeless I was sleeping in my car in the parking lot at Avenue mm-hmm. Mall. And one of my friends found out at work and she started crying. I said, I'm fine. But she was like, no, we're gonna go after work today, we're going to have drinks. I'm going to find you somewhere to live. And lo and behold, an old co-worker, they called him. He had a basement in a really nice townhouse. I go to live there. My, um, my gay mama comes and that's when I put up my first ad. And my car wasn't working. So I had this dude who I knew liked me and I knew he would do anything for me, you know, use what you got to get what you want. He would drive me anywhere and I was paying him. So my first future, I remember my first day working, we call working in Miami. I put up ads and I would charge 150 an hour. And I think I had, I made my rent that day and a half and I never went back to Chili's and that was it. Wow. Wow. And that's when I started. And from then on, it was, I don't, it was, I told my friends what I did and slowly, I'm, and I'm trying to think about now the progression of it because it was just so quick. I just started doing it. Then I moved out of a few places. I went on to a life had been hard. Like it's just so much to talk about, but through the phases of my life in the past two or three years, I've toured everywhere, but I've had, I've had people save my life. I've had white men save my life. I've had Hoenn save my life from what I've seen, the people that I've met. And I graduated. I called myself retired last year because I had somebody who I call a friend and a colleague now. I was was paying me like $1,200 a week. You know, I was getting, I had a new pair of Jordans every week. I had whatever I, I I had whatever I wanted. BMW, my house is furnished. And I did that in two years because that was the goal. As soon as I went into home and I got I, my mindset was out of home because that's not a career. But when you already have a career mindset, it, that's what I tell people when people it's almost a disrespectful question to me. Well, you, you're not going to have body forever. Well, what makes you think I am? I'm human. I know that. That's not why I, yep. hope. I hope for capital to fund my dream. Mm. It's a different mm. mindset. It's a secret. Behind sex work. 
for letting out secrets. <laughs> and in, two years, in two years, the people who started off with me, who would try to show me the ropes, I really work on my own. And I tell people this for a reason because I meet a lot of people that have, they don't meet hoes that work like me, that have what I have, that do what I do. And it's, I would tell, you know, people, I'm real quick on the phone and some of these, some of the trans women I work with and some of the other guys I work with, they like to schmooze and try to talk and I'm very business minded. And I see how that didn't work for them, but they would tell me to try to perpetuate that. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. You know, if you, I'm, I hang up, if it's not like business, or if, you, if you, if you cash at me, we can <laughs> tell you on the phone. Baby. We can talk. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. Money talk. Okay. It's, it's, it's all about the money. If you haven't paid me yet, I will answer the questions. I'll be congenial. I'll be as cordial as I can be. But at the end of the day, yeah. I'm, you know, but I see how that got me, you know, to somebody in the British Virgin Islands who owns a law firm. I mean, I'm opening a business there now with him. Mm -hmm. I've made connections. Like, Hohen has to be, mon the money has to be the basis of Hohen. Yeah. Like I tell people like I got white. If you and and where I come from, being black, it's America. Racism is real. But being black in my position, having white privilege, swing from my dingling is an advantage. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I've been to jail. You know, it's. Yeah. It's an occupational hazard, I feel like, for a lot of people. In, yeah, in America, in, it can be. Or just in general, really, honestly. Well, yeah. But yeah, that's my journey. <laughs> thank you. All right. Roman? Um, first, let me say thank you so much for sharing your story and for sharing your journey. Oh. Yeah. Um, thank you. That was, that was beautiful. Thank you. I um, so a little bit about... A little bit about my story. Um, I told a little bit about it um, the first panel, um, but just to catch some some viewers up, um, I started. I mean, I guess you can call it escorting. Um, I didn't necessarily call it escorting. I just kind of started tricking um, at eighteen. Um, I ran a trap house at eighteen because um, I just needed to make rent. I needed to make money. Um, and so for me, getting into it originally was all about survival. Um, I needed to eat, I needed to live, I needed to have a roof over my head. Um, so I did whatever I had to do in order to make sure that I had that money in my pocket. Um, as I continue to grow up in age and to get into my meanness and to myself, um, I learned that I actually really love escorting um, and I love the connection that I'm able to make with it. So 18 till about, let's say like 22, um, was all about survival. 22 to like, I'm 27 now, so 22 till about 26, yeah, 26. Um, I didn't necessarily do sex work. Um, I'd done some light video work. I had dated a couple of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I would date them, it would usually be like, I'm smart and I'm smart with my words and I'm not a pull pull that charm on real quick. But I'm just like, <laughs> you're so funny. Yeah. Like uh, sugary you know, almost were... kinda. Exactly. Um <laughs> I learned how to do that from a really young age. Mm -hmm. Um so 22 to 26, that's that's kind of what I did. Um I wouldn't necessarily go out with them because they had money, but I also like I knew they did. Yeah. Um Next year, I quit my job. I was in retail, or I've been in retail for the last 10 years. Um, I've always been like retail management, retail leadership. And so I quit my job to go into escorting full time. Um, and I've been doing it full time ever since. Um, I love, love, love what I do. I love the connection I'm able to make and the freedom that I have from it. Um, mine ne wasn't necessarily rooted in money from last year. Um, again, the survival aspect of it is much different than where I'm at now with my escorting. Um, right. I love making people's fantasies and their, their fantasies come into reality. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to say about it. Um, <laughs> oh? No, yeah. also, and, and I think you really brought us in last time and it's, and it's good that you came back this time to kind of embellish a little bit more for our audience to let them know what's going on. 
My question is short, and I'm going to give it to you, Roman, first, and I'll give it to you, AJ, which is for the audience that's watching, if you had to sum it down just real quickly, what's the difference between survival sex versus conscious sex for an income? Like, what's the mm. difference? So if someone's out there and they are doing sex action, how would they categorize their action? So if you just sum it up into a quick response, what would it be to the audience? Yep. My quick response is survival sex is saying is the saying 20 bucks is 20 bucks. Right? You, everyone knows that saying 20 bucks is 20 bucks. That's survival sex. Mm. Consciously going into um, escorting or consciously going into sex work um, is consciously knowing you're going into business for yourself. Right? So 20 bucks is no longer 20 bucks. 20 bucks is not my standard. Um, and that's not the service I'm offering. Mm. So you can give me 20 dollars. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, I don't care about your twenty dollars, um, but that's the difference, and that's the, for me the quickest way I can sum it up is one: you're just I'm gonna take ten, I'm gonna take twenty, I'm gonna take whatever I can, and the other one is saying, I am a product, I'm offering a service, and you will pay what I'm telling you to pay, and there's no questions. Um, you're coming into an Apple store versus walking into a thrift shop. That's a great Nothing way. Nothing thrifting is wrong. You know? yeah. But, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. AJ, to you, what would be your, and the reason why I wanted to be quick for the audience so that you're aware of is because some people will, you know, will give them criteria list after criteria list and, and that loses them. So I kind of want, what's your quick and dirty for the audience between the two? Sex for survival and- Actually, Norman put it really, that's the first point he made about your pricing. Like, I think it's all in the desperation in it. It's, it's more behind the scenes. It's more your own intention, really. If I were to say, to piggyback what he said, it was such a good answer, but um, your intentions, why you're doing it. Because like you said, if you need money, I mean, and there are levels to it. When I only have $1,000, you know, my price goes down to 200 But if I do, if, if I have a $1,200 day, I might pass up to 300 because it depends on, it goes, it's like a roller coaster. But at the end of the day, I've, as far as sex for survival for me, I've never lived that life. But I think the difference is what you're charging and the intention behind it. Yeah, it's like okay. based on needs almost, right? Like how much you, yeah. what you are, what you have to do to make your your needs met, you know, exactly. your basic needs yeah. to just like yeah. move over my head, food in my mouth, like things like that. Do you need that? Yeah. Or do you really just need to make like a high dollar day and that's, why you're doing it, you know what I mean? Exactly. You it, you need and it, it, like Alicia, it brings me back to kind of like one time when I was out at the Parliament House and just to kind of sum up a visual version of what these men are telling me is that when I was walking from the Parliament House, I had a good night, some guy came up to me, propositioned me and said, you know, I'll do this to you, right? Not only was the amount low, but he was also like his product, his business, his body wasn't kept. Not that he wasn't in shape, but he just, had like an odor and he had things like this. So he was putting himself into a place of desperation that I felt. So the money he asked for, the $20 that he asked for to do said act to me, I just gave it to him. Cause it was like the energy that I felt was a need for the money, not like he was making a come up off of me in a better way. Mm -hmm. That's so, another thing too. And that was just like my story of my experience when I, a random Tuesday night at the house, but Alicia, sorry, yeah, I'm gonna just give that story. No, 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 you're you're fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think those that those are every what everyone said is was such a great way to put you know to phrase that frame that question. Um, and then to move on, if uh, you had three minutes to convince a public official that was open to the idea of either decriminalizing or legalizing sex work, what would your argument be to them? like to help, you know, to, to further their their thought process on that. You want to go around? Yeah, sorry. I'm sure. I want to go um, I, I, Absolutely. I've actually given this a lot of thought. Um, so, um, I, so one of the things that I really like to use um, when it comes to decriminalizing sex work, obviously it's the oldest profession um, and, you know, everyone has sex. But my biggest thing about it is why are we punishing folks for being consenting? 
why are we punishing individuals for a consensual engagement with another individual? Um, we don't punish people for going to a therapist. Um, we don't punish people for going to the doctor. Um, and sex workers save lives. Um, I, I can literally give you a list of people that I've saved their life, um, of people that I've talked down off of the ledge. And not people, not friends, not family, clients that I've talked yeah. off of the ledge. Um, That's people that cool. were just uh, HIV positive and didn't know how to handle it. And because myself as an HIV positive open sex worker, they had the funds to hire me and they didn't originally hire me to talk about HIV, but because it was that connection, they were able to talk about it and then get on medication for themselves. Right. Um, so that's my biggest argument for them is why are we punishing folks for saving lives? We don't do that for any other life-saving profession. profession. Um, and again, for me, escorting saves lives. Yeah, I love that. That's great. AJ? Um, well, first, I would ask them, have they ever abolished it? Have you ever gotten with a sex work? Has any developed nation any, anywhere? And then I would show them the statistics in other countries of the trans women, women period, and the more vulnerable people that die. Because mm -hmm. my thing is, if you have something that's government regulated, if you see people aren't stopping it and you see that your counterparts, your developed nations are making it legal, it's legal in, in uh, London. I think it's legal in France. It's legal in a lot of places. And my thing is, if you're trying to stop people from dying from prostitution, give them governance, give them something to go to, give these people a place, okay, where if they feel threatened, they can hit a button and somebody mm -hmm. can save their life. But now, where's the accountability? Yeah. Because my thing is, my instincts are really home. Okay, I've I've been in, in 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 other situations that aren't so nice, doing what I do. And and the thing is, I tell that client, we gonna have, can't nobody call nobody. We're not protected by nothing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And all these escorts, I know clients that have killed escorts in self defense because they've had to because of the sleazy things that escorts do. Sleazy, sleazy assholes is what I call them. The ones that are stealing, they need clients need protection too. If they can call somebody and say this hoe is trying to steal from me, they don't have to kill them. It's one less dead body. It's one less bad situation. Yep. So if you truly want protection for people, you should give them protection and protect them. It's not. And I wouldn't. I wouldn't frame it as legalizing sex. No, sex. Sex workers need protection. If you want death off your hands a little bit, protect them. It's easier to protect them than dealing with with how uh, the desperation that comes from escort. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think the most powerful thing that I'm hearing is that there's only a lot of good to gain from <laughs> legalizing it, from hearing both of your responses. Like with me, I went to school, became a social worker, blah, blah, blah. They have code of ethics, right? What I see happening for yeah. the sex work <laughs> field is you create codes of ethics, insurance policies, liability, governance. You have all of these yeah. measures in to support the economy and support these individuals' lives. Mm -hmm. um, you also have like in drug testing and things like that that you could employ at certain discretionary means or blah, 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 you know, depending yeah. on however yeah. they worked it out. So yeah. I, I, love, I love what you guys are saying and I wish we were in the position to actually make it legal because I would tap my finger and it would be done. Well, right. I don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> we can uh, try. I don't want it legal. What'd you huh? say? Oh, I, said, no. I don't want it legal. I want it decriminalized. Yeah, so they're they are different, and that's why I didn't want to like yeah. hang too much up about it because basically, like what it boils down to, the differences between the two are just the ways that they're regulated, and also the people that. Yeah you know, are that wind up getting in trouble for those things. Because in, in some models, it's the only the sex workers that actually wind up, you know, being arrested and things like that, whereas the Johns are just able to go free. Well, you know, why is only one party being penalized if that's the case? You know, so there's, yeah. and there's, of course, there's tons of different models and things like that. And I think like, unilaterally, you can say that if something was regulated, there would be a better safeguard in place for when things when things go south. You know, there'd be someone that you could yeah. call, like, "Hey, you know, I was sexually assaulted by this person. Right now, you can't do anything. You know, all you can do is just yeah. suck it up, I guess, and go back to work. Like, how is that fair to people? And how does that give people like the dignity and you know, like the strength to want to do the work that they're doing? It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, yeah, it's great. 
It makes and, sense. So, and so we're talking about definitely a lot of concepts on the like legal side, but I think one of the things that I want to bring to you guys is what is your advice or your recommendations or your ones and twos for anyone that's either trying to get into um, commercial sex work um, or sex conscious sex work as a form of income? Um, or what is your recommendation for someone who's trying to leave survival sex behind and transition into commercial sex work slash conscious sex work for an income? AJ? Or, um, sorry, Roman? I was like, who did? Roman? Do you want to start? Yeah. Me? Yeah, you go ahead, Roman. Okay. Uh, so this will yeah. actually be a, a cute little shameless plug. This is going to be a little, little plug. Um, <laughs> so um, I have been asked this question on various levels. Um, so I'm going to give a quick blurb. Uh, this is also part of the, the plug. I'm currently building a class specifically designed to teach and help uh, individuals how to get into commercial and consensual escorting. Um, not necessarily video work, but I specifically am working and building a course so people can get into escorting. Um, with that being said, the number one thing that I try to teach in those courses and the number one thing that I really focus on um, of what I'm building is knowing and owning yourself. Right. Um, even if that self is a character you've designed, knowing and owning that character, um, I think that is the one thing that, again, really separates it, but also allows individuals to leave survival sex behind. Because um, survival sex, you're in it. Um, there's a great study that's been shown that people that live in poverty, one of the reasons they don't save for long term is because they're always worried about right now. They can't worry about 10 years from now because rent is due tomorrow. Um, so knowing and owning that character that you build or knowing and or, and or owning the person that you're coming into consensual sex work as allows you to leave survival behind um, because you're not so much worried about the day to day. You're mm -hmm. worried about bigger picture. And that's a really hard place to get to. Um, so, and that's why I always encourage people to talk to mental health professionals. Um, but I always encourage people to get to that space first before you even decide or think about or contemplate getting into consensual sex work. Um, so yeah. I think, I think that's powerful because to me, I love everything that you said, but what stands out to me is that moving to that next level is a state of mind first. And then that state of mind is a part of that evolution that launches you into that transition. So yeah, I, I really absolutely. like that. Awesome. So, AJ? oh, before, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, before you answer, Milan, are you there? Yes, how are you? Hi. Hey. Hi, love. Where, Where are, are you? I am so sorry I'm late. No, that's okay. okay. We missed you. Okay. Where are you? I can't see you. I'm. Oh no, I, I'm at home. I took my bra off and everything. Honey, it's possible. Oh, <laughs> oh. 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 many wear the bra? Yes, <laughs> I am comfortable. It she was said a long day today. This camera's not coming on. There's no cash app link to it. It's not coming on. <laughs> It, it has been a <laughs> long day today. You guys just don't know. <laughs> oh, okay, honey. Um, so the question that we just asked before you hopped on was just, um, what's the um, making the transition into commercial sex? So I'm going to give the question to AJ, and then I'm going to come back to you. So um, AJ, what's your what's your response? Um, I would tell people to ask themselves, are they meant for sex work, period? Because I find a lot of people doing it out of desperation. What I a lot of people, the difference is you're not. A lot of people aren't meant for it, and that's why they're doing it out of desperation because they need a quick dollar, and that is the quickest way to make a dollar. But I would ask before they do that, because if if you're not meant for it, it's always going to be something you're doing for desperation because you'll never yeah. be able to throw yourself into it. I tell people I feel comfortable selling my body. I can say that to myself. Yeah. I have different parts that are worth different amounts, but I can sell my body. Look in the mirror and make sure you can tell yourself you can sell your body. And if you look down, if you look away, and if you feel less than, if you can't be a hoe, don't be a hoe. 
period. And my thing is, before you make, that's my thing, why are you doing it? Because I've brought, I've brought a friend on a job. Like, you good looking, big P, we need a second, 250, 250, come on, let's go. And this dude, and I didn't know him too well, so we're, we're in the job. He, what I realized is another thing, you can pay me for sex, but you can't pay me for sex. You can't pay me for the essence of my sex. That's invaluable. So I know how to, and I, the, I have the ability to separate the two. I can do three jobs and then come home and invite a boy over and do my thing personally, because I never mm. have personal sex. Not everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. And so I make, I, I tell people, you have to assess yourself to make sure it's something that you can look at as a business. If you can look at your body as a business, then cool. Yeah. I think that's the first step, making sure you're comfortable because a lot of people doing it for des doing it for you know out of desperation or you know because out of necessity. It, that's just what it is. They aren't meant for it. And this dude I went on a job with, where, you know, he I could tell he did the whole '90s R&B slide in the room, started eating the booty, and and I'm like that's I don't, uh uh that's not how I that, that I didn't show you them ropes, but you do what you want to do. Who told you to do that? Exactly. And, and I'm looking, but I saw he was he wasn't comfortable. So I took the dude and you know started banging him, and the dude left. My friend left in the middle of it. Now I don't know if he left me because we drove there together. I went with him, but I had only only known him for about two or three months. Ooh. So he I afterwards I got the money, went downstairs. The car was still there. I got in the car and he was just staring. And I said, "Are you okay?" He's like, "I can't do that. I can't do that." I said, you can't sell your body, friend. I said, mm -hmm. what you did, I would if I did that, I would be down here quivering in anxiety as well. You did the 90s R and B slide in there eating booty. Now, that's not what you do. It's that's, not what you do. <laughs> that's powerful. And again, I think you know it goes back to that mind. Um, and people having honest, real honest conversations with themselves. Because I don't I don't promote that for everybody. I don't tell everybody sell your body. I make sure, hey, hey. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. I don't tell everybody. Oh, we can't that. hear her. I mean, you know, make sure you can do that first. Just because I can do it don't mean you can do it. Okay. No, mm -hmm. I thank you for that. Exactly. Mulan, you're muted. Mulan. There you so, go. Hello. Mulan, it, let's introduce yourself. Tell the fans who you are. This is, she's a veteran. She's coming back for round two of Ask a Sex Worker Edition. So just tell the audience about a little bit about who you are. And then the question is, how does someone, if you were going to give them advice, how they should transition into conscious sex work, not sex for survival, but conscious sex work for an income? So basically, they just need extra for extra money. Yeah, you, they're not doing it because they're doing it for a place to stay or a, something to eat. They're doing it as a way for to escort to, to have make a, a income. Certain lifestyle, probably. Okay. Yes. Um, well, I'm Mulan Matrice Williams. Um, I work for Miracle of Love, but here I'm today just for myself, representing me, my thoughts, my visions, my past, and my life. Um, what would I tell them? I well, like um, Antonio said, it's not for everyone. Everyone can't do sex work. I mean, um, and when you when I say that, it sounds kind of crazy, but it, it, it's true. It, it's not for yeah. everyone. You have to have a. You have to be strong in the mind. You have to know what you want, and you also have to have a goal. So that's what I ask them first. What is your goal from doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, are you going to stop after you make that goal? For and why are you doing it? Why do you want to come into this? Do you think it's like this glamorous lifestyle because? We do you can make a lot of money but it's a lot of other bullshit that comes with it so just really really see where they are in their mind why they're doing it um and what's the goal what's like what are you trying to do and i will let them know the ups and downs of it okay amazing thank you yeah i think that those are all really awesome answers too and i think like there's really something to be said of of no of like knowing how to look at yourself in the mirror and like see what the reflection is actually giving you you know um so while we're talking about that too i mean i think that that's like such an important skill just as a person in general but what are some life skills that you think that sex work specifically has taught you and how do you think that you can apply those or have you applied those um, going forward 
whether or not you're using sex work as your main source of income. Um, and I'll let you answer first, Mulan. Let's hear back. Um, well, now I'm working at an organization and I still use some of the same rules that I do in sex work with my job and with things that I do. It like, to me, it goes hand in hand. And from sex work, I know how to read people. I can read people. Um, I'm, I'm a quick thinker. Um, I know how to make a profit. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think I use a lot of the things that I did in the sex work and I bring it over. I mean, it's still me. I did sex work for over 20 years. So everything I do is like sex work to me was really a job. It wasn't mm-hmm. just sex, it was a job. I treated sex work as a job. It was my source of income. Yeah. It was how everything got done. Um, I would never look down on it because mm-hmm. it it doesn't, it's not the same for everyone, but luckily for me, right. I was able to sustain it and last. Okay. But I would have to say, yeah, I used to, like, I think, I, I think like a sex worker, I mean, I'm, just like they say, once an addict, always an addict. <laughs> to me, yep. for myself, once a sex worker, always a sex worker. Because right. even though I changed my life, I still have my same sugar daddies for the past 20 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not going to leave them alone. Um, I, I can't leave them alone. They're part of me. They they pay my right. bills. They buy me nice things. <laughs> but the way okay. I, yeah, and why would you want to? Come on, man. Yeah, so, I mean, just being honest. But yeah, it goes hand to hand to me. Yeah, and I don't take for an answer. Even in this job, and I learned that from my job. Like I don't take shorts. I'm not gonna let someone short me. I, when I say something, I say it and I mean it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Roman. Um. Honestly, I I can only think of one for me, um, and that's drawing boundaries. Mm-hmm. Um. So prior to becoming a full-time escort, Um, you know, whenever my job would call me, especially in retail, they'd be like, hey, we need you to come in this day and switch this day off. Like, yeah, sure, you know, anything for the business. Um, And as I've gotten into, again, more consensual sex work and and doing it for myself full-time, I've definitely learned how to draw not only boundaries in itself, but I've learned how to draw stronger boundaries. Um, And I verified and I validated within myself that no is a reason. Um, mm-hmm. If I say no to something, and then you're saying, oh, but why do you say no? Because I said no. Like, no is a reason. Mm-hmm. Um, no is the answer. No is the reason. And no is all encompassing. Right. But though, like, that is the, no, the biggest thing for me that I've taken from sex work. And I still have to learn how to apply it in different areas, like my romantic life. Um, but it's it's slowly coming to a point where I love boundaries and I love the boundaries that I'm able to set. Um, and boundaries don't have to be this evil thing. Um, boundaries should be healthy. Boundaries should be, you know, able to protect self. Um, and that's my biggest thing from sex work is I've learned how to create boundaries and now I really stick with them, especially with clients and friends. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Anton? Um, see, I look at that differently because I brought all my corporate experience over to sex work. Right. Um, so I tend. We can do it backwards if you feel like that's I, a better way for you to I, answer it. You know what I mean? Well, see, I do. To answer your question, I don't feel like because if you look at sex work and if you look at what's, um, uh, if you look at the, the reputation and you look at what most people do, you can't take none of that over nowhere because all these hoes are sleazy. So mm-hmm. I think they need to take the sex out of the work and learn how to work their sex. Ooh. Ooh. They need to, you need to learn how to work your sex to so learn business principles because I was a director of marketing and admissions for skilled nursing facilities, building rapport with my primary referral hospitals. I had colleagues twice my age who I had to get in line every day because they're talking to me like a child and I'm not one. I'm your colleague. I'm 25 and you're 50. I'm not your child. So Ooh. I had to, I've taken all of that, which honestly, my corporate jargon, the fact that I can talk to white men the way they talk to other people in the office, they love that. And that's helped me with my money. So 
I have seen the, I've taken corporate, I've taken everything from my corporate life and this business principles, per, business principles period. And I apply them to my sex work. I really take a lot of the sex out of the work. I am the sex, but as far as conceptually, <laughs> okay. That's a hot take. That, that, I that, love that. You know, I love that. It goes back to knowing your value. And I think I think it's super important. And as we transition into my question, um, you know, I want to I want to give it to Mulan. And then I, I you know, this is how I found you. But you'll, you'll like this question, AJ. Um, but Mulan, in my question for the group, it is sex workers are many things. And as you've retired and transitioned out of it, what is your list of a resume what is, what do you what do you have do you do music do you do um any type of theater tell tell us what you do outside of sex work like how else do you market yourself what is milan right oh. uh-huh as a as a health educator i mean um we love that's what i do now i'm a health educator and um and I'm not trying to save the world, but I'm trying to save my community. <laughs> yeah, um, yes, girl. <laughs> um, that's what I do now. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So, yeah, I mean that's that's all I do. I used to do I used to do shows and pageants, but that's no longer a thrill for me. Um, right now, I'm head over heels over my job. Like I love what I do. Um, yeah. So it's just this. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, and. AJ, how else do you market yourself? I you, you were telling us a little bit about show, but just tell us all the things you do outside of sex work and how you market yourself to the world. Oh, well, I have a YouTube called Antoine Live Entertainment. I do, I have Life 101, which is like life coaching. I do topics like, are you mad or are you done? Making sure before you cut somebody off that you're really done with them. I have a topic called Parents of People Too, teaching people how to stop romanticizing the relationship with their parents and if the relationship is rocky, <laughs> you know, teaching them how to, you know, if there is, if there are issues with their parents, how to take them out of the context of parenthood and look at them as a person to better relate to them, to better work on the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I have Cowboy Confessions, which is the nitty gritty down and dirty, um, <laughs> you know, whole life, period. We see <laughs> Oh yeah, okay, y'all see. Then I have the Aquarian Angle. I <laughs> oh, and, and, and subscribe if you can take it. Call Boy Confessions, and, and I do that too. As you guys do this, I do that to normalize sex mm -hmm. work as well. That's why I get on and talk about what I do because I'm not. You can call me whatever you want. I ain't no dirty hoe. Like it's not a bad thing to do. It's a, and that's why I I use my words. I use my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. I use, you know, people who do want to make people feel like crap. You know. I let them know, like, I come from the world you come from. The job you're gunning for now, I had at 25, baby. So don't, I'm different. I let people know that. And I represent hoes a different way. But I uh, I sing as well. I have a music video. I have two albums out. I have Pandora, on Pandora, Antoine Radio. Okay. Yeah, and I collect books from, I have publishing royalties and stuff like that. I need so. links and pictures. Oh, well, <laughs> well, <laughs> I need really? links and pictures sent immediately. <laughs> she said I need a couple of codes. Yeah, we'll, we'll link go. I'll, I'll find you. We'll find each other. <laughs> we love to make a connection. This is great. Oh, there's a chat. Oh, there's a chat. I can see myself in the chat. There you go. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and Roman. I, what? I, I agree with Sorry. you so much because people will try to make you feel so down for doing sex work. Oh um, yeah, you know what I had to, to make my I built myself up so much to say uh, when I was doing I used to say that I was a prostitute and I said that proudly back in the day. You know I'm a what home, I mean? baby. Because I wasn't gonna let anyone make me feel less than just because of what I was doing. Thank because you. Because at the end of the mm -hmm. day I would feel like I, I let myself know, hey, I eat every night. I don't know how I never went hungry doing this. You know, you. So I, I told myself so many different things to make myself feel so good about myself doing it because people will really try to tear you down from doing sex work and you they will really try to yeah, tear well, you down. they will make you and you can't even that part of me you can't even touch like it's it's laughable because and part of it is because where i come from a lot of hoes don't come from where i come from like i'm not i started doing this at 29 
So you talking to me like that, like mm -hmm. what you work in a cubicle? I was managing you 10 years ago, honey. So, I, I, so I have different experiences, different perspectives. And people will try to make you feel like you're disgusting. That's the first thing. Even my own family, my own daddy called me a man whore. And I had to remind him, I said, that's fine. My dick F's up banks, uh, BMWs, West Elm furniture. You have you leave the responsibility of your children to the world. You're a man whore too, and you're right. We both are, but the impact of yours is worse to me. So you can make me feel however you want. I'm gonna get my money. Hmm? I, I really appreciate that. that. That's a raw statement that yeah. you know. It, which I mean, it's surrounded with emotion, and you're being very accurate, and you're pushing back on maybe someone who's taking it, uh, taking for granted what the point of your sex work is. Yeah. Now all my father has called me a man boy and condescension. All right, rude. <laughs> And so, Roman, um, what is yours? What I, you were doing a plug um, for your class. What else is a part of Roman's brand, as we love to say? What else do you do? How else do you market yourself? <laughs> I love that little fly smile before I start talking. <laughs> um, so, what reason we call it Roman's brand um, is because I simply exist. Um, I, I walk through this world, um, and I learned at a very young age, I walk through this world as me. Um, and, you know, there's times, you know, I definitely fall. But for the most part, I walk through this world as me. I mean, I'm literally wearing right now short shorts and uh, stockings. Um, and that time I'm going to walk through this world, I went to the store like this and say something. Because all it does is continue to encourage me to walk into your store mm -hmm. like this. Um, mm -hmm. Because this is how I feel comfortable dressed. Um, in terms of marketing myself and marketing my business, um, I I also own my own consulting company. Um, so I try to work with small mom and pop, um, small business owners, specifically small business owners of color, um, small business sex workers, um, small business people that may be living with HIV, um, and consult them on social media and digital marketing tactics. Um, how to engage with their community members to better their storytelling opportunities. Um, and then I also create my own projects. Um, so uh, what was it, two years ago, I created a video project uh, for World AIDS Day. Um, this year, um, I couldn't quite get it off the ground, but I've been able to build myself up through my social media. Um, and I know a lot of people talk bad about social media, um, but I'm the millennial that I'm like, no, nah, social media 100% all the way. Yeah. Um, because I am so authentic through my social media. And because I'm authentic through that, um, it's allowed me to build a community around myself. Um, because I'm vulnerable through social media, I was, again, able to build community around myself. And through that community, I've been able, I've been really fortunate to get funding for certain projects. Um, I've been able to tell my narrative um, to people. I've been able to talk about the fact that I was a bug chaser. Um, I'm living with HIV. I'm a sex worker. Um, those are all things for me that continue to market my business and continue to market myself. Um, it's all the different parts about my story and my narrative that I'm able to share right. with the world. Um, it's, it's that sharing, it's that vulnerability, and it's that authentic, authenticity um, that really helps and separates me in terms of marketing for my business. Uh, I'm a sharer and I'm just like, here's what it is. You're going to get it and you're going to read it. And if not, then that's on you. Um, <laughs> Girl, <bye. laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, listen, I can publish. If you don't read it, that's on you, but I'm going to continue to do it um, and grow from there. <laughs> if you don't like it, you're wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> Hello. And I'm only 27. I mean, I'm 27 and been doing this for a full year um, and own my business at 27. Like, I am i don't know any other millennials that are like me, um, not to like to my own horn. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're they're lazy. They're not. I'm lazy too. I'm super lazy. I love being lazy. But because <laughs> I love being lazy, I know that when a time comes, I'm like, mm, I really have to do a lot of work today, like last minute. Um, in order to have a super duper lazy week or right. three weeks, whatever. <laughs> Just set your timeline. And three weeks binge watching Hulu is fine. And I think I think sometimes there's important themes to be picked up here. Like, you know, AJ was talking about, and both what you're talking about as well, <laughs> that there, there's generational differences in the 
in the ethics and desire to work. Our grandparents and our parents have the I'm going to work till I'm dead mentality uh -huh. and that work defines who I am. And we're a part of this new era where we can work very smart instead of very hard. We can we can make the same yeah. amount of money in less time. We're not defined by one position, yeah. we're defined by many. So I love I love what you're what everyone's saying. Um and as we uh, and go to sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna like piggyback on that. Um just for me specifically like, not just that, I think a lot of people, as we continue to get into the younger eras, are also getting into the mindset of, it's not about the amount of stuff. It's not about, um, and this is not a day at you, AJ, but it's not about having West Elm furniture. It's about having a chair. Um, like for myself, I, I live out of one suitcase and I would not trade my entire suitcase of clothing, not anything, I would not trade my suitcase of clothing for any car in the world. I wouldn't. I will take my suitcase of clothing um, and I think as we continue to to see younger generations, you know, become, you know, the age of adult, I think that's also part of the mentality of what we're getting. It's it's not just about working smarter, but they're also just placing less value on things. They're placing more value on self um, and more value on just living. Um, so yeah, I love that. Yeah, I love that. So we'll transition into our last question, which I'm kind of sad. Like, I don't want it to end. I've, I could talk to you guys all day. Um, but so, you know, we're kind of talking about all of the all the different ways in which we market ourselves and our different like streams of income, the different things that we do. So um, what do you feel like is the shelf life for your career in sex work specifically? And um, for Mulan, you know, maybe you can, I can phrase it like, did you know that, that, that you were coming to that point when you were in it? Like, had, did you have that kind of idea? Like, I'm only doing this for one more year. Or do you know, you know what I mean? Like, what does that look like for you? And what do you feel, how do you feel like you will transition out of that? If you will, you know, because there are definitely lifetime sexes. So as we've talked about, you know, everyone has a different, a, a very different take on what they do. Um, so, Mulan? Yeah. Um, I don't think there's really a shift. Like, it's just, it's up to that individual person, that individual. Right. Um, I have a friend that's 50 who looks about 35 and they're still pushing. You know, um, for me, I, I didn't have an expiration date. Right. You know, for me, this was my that was going to be it for me. I, I didn't want a job. I was comfortable. Um, I was brainwashed also to think that, you know, I would never be able to get a job. You know, I, I'm trans. That's a mark. You know, I have an extensive police record. That's another <clears throat> mark. I don't have that much education. So for me, that was it for me. I was going to I'm just saving up for my own retirement, you know. Um, but luck had it that someone reached out to me with the job opportunity and thank God I took it and it changed my life. You know, it gave me a different outlook on everything. Um, but to be honest, if I would not have got that job, I still would have been doing what I was doing. Wow. Right. Just because I was comfortable. And like I said before, that was my job. Right. That was my yeah. job. Yeah. Absolutely. And then I just want to clarify too, I'm not saying like, obviously that anything has to have a shelf life. I'm just saying for, for, you know, personally, if you feel like there is, you know, for you, what would that be? And then, you know, what are the steps that you personally will take to transition out of it? So Antoine, did you want to? Um, I agree with Milan a lot. Some of my friends ask me, but I tell people that's, that's your business. But mm -hmm. me personally, and I can tell by the way you phrased the question, you were just asking objectively, like, do you think? Yeah, that? no, no, no. Yeah. I was, yeah. uh, because a lot of people think they try to perpetuate, you better get out of that. I don't focus on anything negative or fearful. I, I tell people, because I've had to tell people, if you need to do, like, get off people's back. Like, you, a lot of holes, they, they say, okay, I've seen them go back to work because a lot of the stigma associated with it, you know, a lot of hoes want to hold and take mm -hmm. the job, which that makes no sense to me because I don't know. But people, you know, um, 
focus on that. But I tell people, no, find something to focus on. You make honey, hoe in your you need money to do anything. So find your passion, find your mm-hmm. legacy, find what you want to sustain you. And for me, that's always been music. And I've always, and because I do have a different perspective, I'm coming from, I was working to be CMO by the time I'm 50. So I'm coming from different things. I still get job offers for, you know, salary positions. So I have less worry and I try to let other people know, I don't care where you come from, whether you were forced out on the block at 15 because your mama didn't, you know, F with you. You don't have to look at going as something you have to stop. Find something that you want yeah. to make your money on. Find what you want your name to be, what you want your market to be on the world. That's bigger than me than stopping home. The market mm-hmm. market on this yeah. world, focus on that. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Roman? Um, I don't know if it's necessarily that I have a shelf life. Um, I knew, I do know that eventually I will transition out of um, primarily doing sex work, um, but I will not, it's the saying, um, one day I will be out of the hoe game, but the hoe game will never be out of me. Right. Um, because the so, said kind of, you know, earlier. That, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so one day I will transition out of, of doing primary sex work um, as my primary source of income. Um, and that day for me looks like, you know, having a lot of other passive incomes um, is being able to do a lot of different gigs. Um, I am not a nine to five person. I hate nine to five to, with the utmost 100%. I cannot do it. Um, I had a job for three weeks last winter and I literally walked out after three weeks, walked out. And I said, I quit, I'm done. Um, I can't do it. I'm not a nine to five girl. I am a project person. I'm like, oh, I want to do this and this and this and this. Um, so for me, it's not that I necessarily have a shelf life. I just know that I will transition out of, out of it one day. Um, but that day is not coming anytime soon um, because it's a part of me. Um, yes, I, I look at it as a job and yes, it, it's a source of income, but it's also part of my identity. Um, I'm I'm a whore, I'm a hoe, I love sex. Um, but I also, again, me escorting is about the connection. I love making that connection with those individuals. Um, and I love the mm-hmm. conversations that I get because I get booked by a lot of older clients, 60s, mm-hmm. 70s, and 80s. I love the stories that they tell me. Um, right. I love being able to be here for them. So for me, those are all things like, that's all part of me. And right. that's all things that I don't think I can ever leave behind, um, even as I transition out of sex work. So in essence, escorting will always be a part of my life. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with that. It's about relationships too. You build relationships with people, yeah. so it becomes about people helping you out and less about. I have guys the down payment on my BMW. The dude sent me that he didn't touch me because we built a relationship and mm-hmm. it's different. So, like you said, I like how you put it. You can take me out the whole game, but I'm probably I'm gonna always have a daddy on deck cash after me, son. <laughs> Uh, DOD, Daddy on Deck. Yeah, oh, I like that. Right, but I also do the way it's all about your vision and yourself, your self imagery and what you. I picture myself like being on the same level. That's why I kind of I put myself around people that own businesses because I picture myself, you know, being chairman with my clients in 15, 20 years owning my mm-hmm. business. Yeah. I don't, you know, so I said joking, but I do picture myself going, nah, I'm good, I'm out. Mm-hmm. I love so, that. But I can't, I don't judge anybody. If you're 55 and you still got somebody taking care of you, and that's you, I, don't, I can't judge that. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, love, I love everything. I love everything that I'm hearing. And as we're approaching the end of this interview, you know, like Alicia said, this is the saddest part because this is real raw conversation that people need to hear from every single side, a safety side, an ethical side, don't push your agenda on me side, my body's my own side. There's so many parts of this conversation that the world needs to hear. And as we get to closing thoughts, I wanna give everyone the opportunity to leave the audience with a piece of information and I'll close this out last. So AJ, what do you wanna leave the audience with at the end of this interview? Um, I just want to tell the audience to make sure you know who you are. Make sure you don't 
take the sex out of work and work your sex if that's what you want to do. Think if you think too much about selling your body, don't do it. But just in life period, I tell people to think about a legacy. Always think in the future. I think about my grandkids. Like I'm 32 now, thinking about 50. And I just tell people to think about your life, your prosperity, your legacy, and what you want to leave. The indelible mark you want to leave behind in this world, that's all you need to focus on. And if you use sex to get there, do it safely. But at the end of the day, don't. Some people focus too much on sex work. Don't focus on that. And if you are focused on that too much on that, you shouldn't do it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Of course. Roman? Stop asking me to do shit for free. Okay. <laughs> Um, do not go into my inbox and ask me for nudes. Do not ask me for a promo code. Do not ask me how I can get, how can I be an escort like you? Do your research. I am not your teacher. I'm not an educator. I do, I will absolutely be your educator. And as soon as my class is up, it'll be on Facebook and you can find it. And I will send you the link personally. But if you hit me up, you ask me, Oh, I want to be you. Can you give me some tips? I, I will say, here's my cash app. Here's my Venmo. And call it a day. There you go. I love that. From Black Lives Matter. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, like, Alicia, I, 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 assuming you're not going to take offense to this. And I'm sorry if you do. But listen, white folks, white people, white people watching this, take a lesson from Black Lives Matter. The woke white folk. Y'all were so woke during Black Lives Matter saying, oh, we need to teach our own community. We need to teach our own white community. Do the same thing for sex workers. Mm -hmm. I, I, because I'm a sex worker, I'm not your educator unless I choose to be, which is why I'm building a class. But do your own education. Educate the community that doesn't know about it. I should not have to go into your community and teach them about what they don't know. Mm -hmm. There's Google. Wow. Same reason why a black person should never have to go into a group and have to teach all the white folks about what black people go through. Do your research, Google it, and then ask me a question. You really want help? Do the research first. Don't make me do the first 25 miles driving for you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Heard. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <Yeah>. Amazing. <laughs> Mulan, what do you want to leave the like, audience with? <laughs> I just want to say um, to the people, just remember, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. Mm. And um, yeah, stop judging and stop judging. You know, every person, every different, everyone who does the same thing doesn't have the same stuff. Story. Everyone has their own story and get to know that person's story before you start judging. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. That part. <laughs> Alicia? Uh, well, I just want to thank all of you, obviously, uh, for being on because I think it's so important that, you know, we have these discussions like, you know, PJ was saying so that because there is probably someone out there that's, you know, wondering like, oh, you know, can I get into this? And some, something that someone said is going to strike a chord and like change their life. And, you know, that's what all of this is all about is, you know, opening eyes and kind of like fostering a community of better allies and we can be better to each other, you know, and better inside the community. Because at the end of the day, you know, like we're all we have. Yeah. So uh, yeah. thank you yeah. for sharing your stories and being so vulnerable. And, you know, not not everyone is capable of that. So that's like a that's like a little superpower y'all got. I appreciate that. <laughs> Love it. And I think I think the thing that I want to close the night with is that you've heard it straight from these individuals' mouths. They are more than sex work. They have lives, passions, loves, experience, desires, and things that they shouldn't be demonized for. So when you're out there and you're sitting there judging someone for how they live their lives, just come back and look at the tape. Share this tape with individuals. Know that there's more behind there's secrets behind every sex worker and every sex worker has a story and that story is important. So remember the story is always going to be important. Amen. So yeah. as we close out this night, we're gonna go off live and start recording our OnlyFans content <laughs> and put that up on our other page. Alisa, you can take us off live, honey. Right. Staying Bye. ready for this. <laughs> Where are you getting masks? There you go. Ha, ha, ha.